we're now recording just so you know now everyone knows consent to be recorded granted uh uh yes if anyone has any announcements uh interesting opportunities um they want to say like what they are dreamed of is and uh, or if you're looking for like uh, an anonymous benefactor or you are one uh now is a good time to speak up i'll start i would love yes i'm i'm looking for some killer uh just drupal everything people devops people uh, open source experience maintaining modules and stuff like that is a big big good thing community documentation um all that stuff uh i would love to work with you and hear from you so give me a shout anyone else i'll hop in <clears throat> dave hey hey my name is dave kopachek um i i am up in the cat skills the last time i was at a, I think I spoke at one of these a couple of years ago, um, but I am an independent Drupal developer, always looking for, you know, anything. I can be your skunk works. I can, you know, whatever anybody needs. Um, and I just looked on, I was on Drupal.org and I've been registered on Drupal.org for 10, 14 years, 10 months. So I've been working with it for a while now. So. All right. Very cool. Do you have a, uh, Mention yourself in Slack so people can hit you up after the call. I will do that. Yeah, because I there's no way for me to tell your email <laughs> yep. or any of that. Where in uh, the Catskills are you? I am in Delhi, New York. So. Delhi is that the one that looks like Delhi? It does. It looks exactly <laughs> like Delhi. Now yep. I will. I remember to try to. Yes, there's Delhi and Cairo. Yep, That's near Cairo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh... I'm Sean Robertson. Um, I've been working with Drupal since about 2003. Um, I've maintained a lot of stuff for Drupal 6. Uh, not a lot since then, just due to client concerns. But uh, I am currently available. I will also post in the Slack. Sean, Sean R. I feel like we yep. go back. Oh, yeah. Way back. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> And Very Dave cool. gets subjected to my lesson plans to teach uh, the CWA. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, actually. I really enjoyed that. Good. Uh, I just Googled. It, as, well, you can see my screen, right? So there you are. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> Dean Space. Yeah, my user ID on Drupal.org is 7074. It gives you an idea how long I've been around. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Um, I remember the 2004 <laughs> campaigns was when I first started hearing about Drupal. Yeah, like Dean Howard Dean used it, and I think uh, Wesley Clark and like some other folks, and like all the big Drupal folks came out of that, like Josh K. And yeah, I know and Josh, people. I know Josh and Zach well. I wear their Pantheon shirts all the time. Yeah, um, awesome. Zephyr yeah. Teach out, there were a bunch of them that were involved in the Dean Space project. Uh, Never teach out came from there. Or yeah, uh, she was involved, and in, she she oh. later ran the Sunlight Foundation, which open sourced some stuff. Um, oh, she was that. she was around. Yeah, I've known her for a long time. I didn't know she was connected to the Drupal space. Uh, I think Zephyr hired Zach for Dean Space or for for Howard Dean's campaign. Yeah, there was something like that. I don't remember the exact details. She was a a blogger on the Dean campaign, but was also involved with a lot of the Drupal folks. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I was, I've been thinking a lot about history uh, when we're planning the Drupal camp because we're about to recruit people for sessions and whatnot. And uh, I feel like getting people to talk about the bad old days would be fun, a fun topic area. Oh yeah, like the time where you couldn't just hide the login box without doing just, a hack. <laughs> well, I feel like for New York, okay, so every camp kind of has a hack is trying to figure out what its focus is right because especially now that it's online you have the same camps with the same sessions every day so um my feeling is just that like my my favorite thing about new york was just how much real world experience i got you know like the projects are so big and so real and government projects as education projects um you know all, everything sony music did like you know big big business stuff so i feel like 
focusing on that, like focusing on the case study of like the real world business use cases of Drupal uh, might be a kind of a cool thing for the Drupal NYC camp. To yeah, focus. I so I was the lead backend developer on WWE.com and uh, <laughs> teachforamerica.org. Yeah, um, seen that. I, I, I worked on some really big ones. So mm -hmm. I think that'd be fun. Uh, so. Yeah, um, you know, like, I, did, I, I I thought of Noel. I'm yeah, like, I know him really well too. Let's I've have done. him do a keynote and just let him talk about whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty entertaining too. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for the, those who don't know, I like I presented at a Drupal meetup one time on Lando, and I was pleased to see that you all were using Lando for the uh, uh, the Drupal NYC camp site. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, hey Neil. Uh, we thanks for joining we are just wrapping up announcements for hiring or looking to be hired and a last call for that do we just put that in the uh, meetup slack I channel would recommend, yeah yeah if everyone could just sit, just whatever if they want to post links or anything just put it in the, the slack channel you know not much we can thanks. do in the virtual space or can't i'll, I'll jump in and say uh, for the call i'll jump in and say uh i'm a freelance developer uh jd leonard and um I'm doing that for oh i don't know eight years now full time for the most part and um uh, i've got availability starting in september so we'd love to hear from anybody who needs a uh, drupal architect um i know that a company a really good company called agile six is hiring they uh with elijah lynn uh who is a former new york uh citizen <coughs> um you can find uh the project is va.gov it's a major amazing project um really great team uh service disabled veteran owned small business so I would just give them a shout out because I know they're hiring. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, if we want, let's maybe who's, let's look at, we've got eight minutes till 630. So I don't need to jump the gun, but um, let's go through the deck, right? So housekeeping, if you're not talking, please mute. Someone might mute you if you don't. And you can't be offended. <laughs> Um, mute yourself when not speaking politely interrupt speakers with your questions so be polite about it I guess is the rule we're trying to say here. <laughs> um, you know we're going to be nice um, don't yeah try not to use Google's meets text chat um, it's very it's temporary and hard to see people miss it I never see it um, when I use hangouts um Apparently, it's disruptive for the speaker, and we also want to be able to continue talking after this call. So please join the Slack if you're not in there already. Um, and why don't we, yeah, just, it doesn't really, I don't know, seems silly, but if everyone wants to just take seven minutes after I finish the talks, uh, we'll just to, like take a breather and say hi in Slack. So today, uh, Sean will be presenting on decouple Drupal, bridging the gap between marketer and developer needs. Um, I don't think we get, we didn't get a description in there. Um, and then workflows in Drupal with Maestro. So how about we just freestyle it? So bridging the gap between marketer and developer needs is a marketer, like the content editor in this case. Yeah. Anybody like it could be a site builder role. Uh, it could be somebody from the marketing team, or if it's a publishing side, you can think of, uh, you know, like an editor. Yeah. Whoever's entering content basically. Great. And because often when you say marketing, it's like they're making content, but they also need it to be accurate, right? They need it to be published at the right time. Uh, exactly. There's workflow, there's SEO. They, they want to do a lot more than just enter content. That's the whole context of the talk. Like, you know, uh, yes, if you want to. I'm very excited just... to see your talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Decoupled Drupal content ops is a very, uh, still very early mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry. All right, thank you. Uh, and workflows in Drupal with Maestro, is that like content workflows or what is that for, Jed? So, yeah, Maestro provides you an engine, uh, an API for you to build your own workflows and provides a UI for you to build workflows out of the box in a graphical kind of canvas, like a flow chart. Um, but certainly the workflows wouldn't be limited to anything except your imagination. Um, it's not content moderation focused, Although the example I will walk you through will be about content moderation. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so it's like an entity level thing. 
sort of yeah yeah it, it, it's its own and it, it definitely uh creates its own entities that are processes and queues uh, um it's a very extensive contributed module it's been part or it's been available in drupal at least since drupal 7 i've worked with it in both drupal 7 and drupal 8 so it's got some uh you know some some experience under its belt so all right cool uh all right so thanks to our organizers uh i'm just emceeing but thank you for the shout out in the picture ho ling and jd and chris and everyone else um and join for uh follow along tweet slack um in, we're inviting uh, of course you to support the dribble association uh they make everything happen for us please be a member um and uh yeah i guess events uh these are all the things there's a lot of things coming there's probably even more that we're not thinking of but uh again check out drupacal.com to get the full list uh yes drupal camp nyc will be virtual let's just say everything's virtual and it's not just virtual <laughs> let's just say it's it is online for everyone forever even if we happen to go places <laughs> um and uh one ah, i don't see um govcon there's a drupal govcon coming up that should be on here um i believe in august also so make sure you check that out uh yes that's the date we decided the date uh, i'm now i joined the, the meet the meetup on tuesday where you plan on tuesdays um check out the hashtag meet uh i'm sorry camp planning slack channel i believe it is right camp organized sorry camp organized slack channel uh, it's all, it's open to join uh, every Tuesday. I think is the day we discuss it. Uh, we're, we've picked the dates, and uh, that's what's going to be. Now that it's going to be virtual, we can firmly and, say it's the. And weekend. we definitely need more. Go ahead. Sorry. I said we definitely need more volunteers. Yes, there you go, Scott Walpaul, uh, volunteer, asking, uh, representing the, the team, asking for more volunteers. So, uh, you know, email's fine, but. Ping us in Slack. I don't know who checks that email. <laughs> um, you know, it's we're, we're online all the time and integrated and everything. So, yep, that's cool. And we're we should be putting out calls for sessions uh, pretty soon here. So think about what you might want to submit and uh, and that's that. And you know, I'm really excited about it. Bringing it back, bringing back the brand and bringing back the NYC camp uh, vibe. So let's do that um again yeah so come help it's a great experience uh you can put it as a volunteer thing on linkedin um make a lot of friends with us and no experience necessary it's drupal <laughs> come in and click add block with us uh it's just a camp website right so it's nice and fun um speaking so i wanted to flip this a little because interested in speaking is like it's hard to get people to be like yeah i guess i should how about, do you know someone that talks about something interesting? Ask them to come speak to us. Like I saw uh, some really great sessions at DrupalCon. So I asked Michael Schmidt to give his talk at Drupal NYC meetup, right? So if you know anyone, uh, whether it's Drupal or some other tech, you know, interesting technical thing, uh, Michael Schmidt's tech, he's a Drupal guy, but the talk was on mental health. Please tell them we are all open doors, right? We have meetups every month, first ones of every month. We would love to get any topic. Anybody can have, can come and present what they like about uh, uh, what they want with us. So not just asking you personally to do it. We will help you kind of get the experience. We're very, very interested in getting new people to talk, um, underrepresented people to talk. But instead of asking people to come out, maybe we all go try to push someone to come out on our own. Get a friend of ours uh, that's really smart and say, you know what? You should really talk about that thing you did. That's awesome. And that way, I think maybe it was a little more likely. Maybe they'll come out. All right. Um, I get, we did this part. Who's hiring? So we'll skip that. Uh, and we did the introductions. And I think it's right on time. 6.30 for our first talk. Uh, Ishan Mahajan is presenting on yeah. from... And you're from Shijan. Forgive me. You, that's, that was you, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, yep. Yeah, from Shijan is going to talk about decoupled Drupal and uh making it happen for marketers and developers both because they both have needs so take it away 
Thanks, Sean. Uh, let me. Yes. How do I stop presenting? Oh. Another window. I think I should be. Aha! There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Okay. Great. So. Hopefully, you all can see my screen. So, as John mentioned yep. today, I'm talking about decoupled Drupal uh, and bridging the gap between developers and marketers. So, this is a bit of a case study, a demo all mixed in. And, and please feel free to stop me in between as well for any questions, and, and we'll have dedicated time for QA as well. So, before I get into the presentation, again, this is something maybe obvious for uh, a lot of us here, or maybe not, but just the rise of the decoupled CMS itself, right, is uh, something that we've been seeing over the past few years, right? And uh, if somebody is not familiar with uh, the concept of decoupled Drupal, it's essentially uh, highlighted in these two different uh, diagrams over here, right? On the left, you have a decoupled Drupal implementation where a CMS like Drupal is responsible for storing the content and managing the content, uh, which is then exposed in the form of APIs and the front end where your site visitors or app visitors are coming. Uh, maybe on a JavaScript front end like Angular, React, Vue, uh, right? And on the right, you have a traditional Drupal setup where uh, Drupal is also responsible for the front end, right? So you use a Drupal's theme engine to uh, render the pages. And there's been a rise of decoupled CMS. If you look at headless content management system uh, in Google Trends, you see uh, a great kickoff about 2017, late 2017. Uh, and you, you can see it's been growing consistently since then. And that's complemented in the Drupal community as well, right? So Dries came out with the future of decoupled Drupal blog post in 2017, I believe. And then he's been coming out with these regular um, flow charts, right? The, the screenshot that you see, uh, there's a link towards the end of the presentation to these. If you haven't checked it out, you should. It's really great uh, about you know how he talks about when you should go decoupled, what are the different, it's, it's a spectrum, right? There's no, uh, between a completely decoupled and a completely coupled implementation, there's a lot of different variations as well. And then this is this screenshot on the bottom left is actually from last month from his uh, keynote, uh, where he again talked about uh, as part of the top five goals for Drupal 10, he talked about be the best decoupled CMS. So this has definitely been a topic of great interest within the Drupal community as well. Uh, so coming to the, this particular presentation and case study, uh, we ran into uh, a situation. Uh, and this is, you know, we were talking about New York customers. So this is a customer out of New York. Uh, they're a big uh, financial advisory firm. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, we got into the project where we, we were working with the marketing team, right? Uh, they were looking for a single CMS. So they were the decision makers. Uh, they were evaluating different CMSs and they landed up on Drupal. We helped them value Drupal and they chose Drupal. And they had, you know, the project was to bring uh, uh, a lot of different CMSs that they had uh, and some websites that were not powered by CMS to bring them all under a single umbrella and build a platform which can be reused across these different web properties. And Drupal was the choice. But then the trouble started pretty early during the discovery phase of the project, right? That's where the front end team from the client uh, got involved, right? And we started, uh, as part of the discovery phase, we started hearing this friction, right? On the left, you can see what the marketing team was looking for. Uh, and why they chose Drupal. So they really love the layout builder that Drupal 8 has now. Uh, they had their content preview and workflow needs. And they, they needed control over SEO analytics, right? So again, uh, you know, when we talk about content authors, it's not you know, always the case that you know, people are only entering content, right? Uh, if you're only entering content, you can go with a pure headless kind of a CMS. That's great. But a lot of a marketing team, and especially in this case, they were looking a lot for a lot more control over the SEO analytics as well, right? So it's not just about adding content. It's also making sure that the content is meeting their SEO standards and they can have control over the layouts and things like that. But the development team, you know, when they got into the project, they weren't familiar with Drupal at all. Uh, but their uh, CTO and the front end lead, right? They, they told us that, you know, they've already standardized an Angular 8 as a front end. And that's a standard that they want to adopt uh, firm wide, right? So this project also had to do that. And so they, of course, had some concerns about learning Drupal. Uh, they didn't want to learn PHP or Twig. They didn't have any experience with it. So you know, we early on we sort of, you know, got a sense that you know what the market team is looking for is more a traditional CMS. Uh, but what the development team was looking for was the decoupled implementation, right? Because they wanted to use Angular 
and they didn't want to use uh, didn't, didn't want to even look at twig or php so this you know uh, this quote is from preston right and uh, it's from his series of blog posts and he's written uh, uh, many thought leadership articles on this particular topic right and he talks about these two different realities which we saw in this project and we've seen with other projects as well right uh, on one hand we have the reality of the cms users who don't really, really care about you know it's whether it's coupled or decoupled right they're more concerned about the functionality uh, which frankly they've been used to do this for years now right with wordpress drupal they've been used to this kind of functionality for a, about a decade now right or over a decade uh, but you know with uh, front end developers you know taking control with their preferences of certain frameworks uh, they started you know as Preston is taking you know talking here whittling away with some non negotiable features uh, which is what was happening in this case as well so what did we do with Drupal and you know, what was the approach? So our first approach was to uh, work with the front end team. So we said, you know, the marketing team, what they want, Drupal is great at that. And you know, we have to go with a couple Drupal approach. Let's see if we can somehow fit in the angular components that the team has been building onto the Drupal uh, front end. And that's what you can call as a progressive decoupled approach, right? So we've worked extensively with a module called PDP, progressive decoupled blocks. Uh, this is an example where we took a vanilla Drupal 8 uh, installation, the you know me profile, and we inserted like a React to do application here, and we did it with their Angular uh, component library as well. So we were able to do this, uh, embed certain components on a Drupal page. But as you can see, you know it, it definitely made the marketing team happy. They were getting what they wanted for, but we we were only partially solving the front end team's concerns. Right, they still had to learn. Yes, everything was working, but it wasn't, you know, as straightforward, right? There was a lot of magic sauce and a lot of things, tooling that needed to happen uh, to make this work, right? So, and they, we, we, to be honest, we couldn't say that, you know, you don't have to learn any PHP or Twig, right? So that's why it wasn't really completely solving their problem. And in the second try, we said, you know, hey, what the marketing team is looking for, it's, it's I mean, can't we do that in a decoupled setup? Because uh, this is a need that, you know, a lot of other teams will also have, right? So then we shifted our focus and we said, let's look at what the marketing team was looking for. And can we do that in a decoupled setup? So uh, this is exactly the things that Dries talked about in his uh, keynote, right? He talked about, he gave three examples and, and we actually worked on all those three and uh, beyond that, right? So ability to use Drupal's layout builder, like a drag and drop page builder with a decoupled setup, ability to support your editorial workflow, which includes previewing and published content, uh, you know, ability to manage your menus. Dries talked about that. These are very straightforward things that you do in a CMS. So why can't we do this with a decoupled implementation as well? So that's where, you know, uh, I'll give you a quick demo of uh, how, you know, what we implemented for them and what is available on Drupal.org. So there's a distribution on Drupal.org that we contributed as part of this project called Easy Content. And this is a demo site that has been set up using that. So let me log in as an admin. And I'll quickly give you a demo of a couple of these features that you know we talked about in this uh, case study and what Dries talked about. So let's talk about the layout builder first. So what we did was this is a demo site which is plugged in. You know, of course, you have the Drupal theme that's on my screen, uh, but we also have a few decoupled application, an Angular application, a Gatsby application, and a React Next.js React application which is hooked up to this demo site. Now uh, this page that you see over here, the home page is set up using the layout builder in blocks. But if I click on Preview React, uh, I, I can I'll bring up the next year's version of this page, and you'll see that it, it looks very similar, right? Because it, it it's using the same blocks, and the placement of these blocks uh, and the content and the configuration is all con uh, controlled by Drupal. So this is a completely decoupled uh, next year's application. But I can create this page and control this page via Drupal, uh, and that's so I'll quickly show how that works. So we have a content type called landing page, which is pretty straightforward. It just has a couple of metadata fields. And I'll set up a demo page. I'm going to save this. It'll give me an empty page. Let me publish this. Of course, you can have predefined layouts as well. But uh, on this demo site, it's a completely empty page. But what, what happens is, uh, as soon as I'm creating this page on Drupal, right, uh, I'll get an equivalent page on my React application as well. You can see, and it's and it's fully integrated in the sense that even the URL alias, you can control the URL alias from Drupal. Whatever you set in your node form will be the URL on the Next.js application as well. And as I start building this page using the layout builder, uh, for example, I'm just gonna 
remove this block that comes here and i'll start with let's say let's add a two column section right so if if you're not familiar with drupal's layout builder you know this is the ui of that it, it allows you to dynamically add regions and within regions you can add uh, components which can be blocks right so we have some blocks over here i'm just going to pick a couple of quick ones like an embed code i'll insert a video here so this is a typical cms workflow where somebody you know with some training is building a page right and i i'm going to pick a social media block here and insert a tweet all right uh, so we have two two components that have been added to two columns of this page uh, now of course this is this is a demo site so uh, there is a drupal theme here as well so you can see uh um, this this page is being rendered on drupal as well but if you are a, if you have a completely decoupled implementation this page will not exist right like you wouldn't have the theme here uh, but what you can do is you can still use the layout builder and place the blocks over there and configure the blocks uh, and then you can go to your decoupled application and if i refresh here you'll see uh now the the two columns are available here as well and we've been able to add these two components on my next js react application and this is completely integrated with the layout builder so i can even uh i i can change this from a two column layout to a single column layout right i can add a single column section or uh, to quickly show you i'll just you know drag and drop and change the order right so i put the tweet on the left i'll put the embed code on the right so whatever you can do with the layout builder uh, will be will work with the decoupled implementation as well so i'll refresh this my tweet will go to the left and uh, the video will go to the right so this is giving you know your cms users control over the page layout as well as uh, different components in a completely decoupled setup as well and uh, so as i mentioned you know as you know the drupal is pretty flexible in terms of the components they can, like this particular component the hero component i can even go ahead the way it's set up right now i can change my uh, background color i can change the image i can even change the uh, the placement of the text right so i can make it left align right align center align so whatever configuration that you're adding to your blocks right or or, or even paragraphs uh, like you can see text position left right center so all this works with the decoupled setup as well so that's you know one part of it one example that we've been talking about a drag and drop uh, layout page builder but even if you don't need this there are certain very basic needs like a previewing unpublished content right that's a very simple need which you know most of the cms users would have but if you go completely decoupled you have to figure that out right it's not available out of the box um, there are different ways to do it a lot of those ways can be you know categorized as hacks so we again we thought about this how do we do this so the approach we took here is like i have an article here uh, this is an article content type uh, which is easy content and this is published right now so if i go to my next js page uh, it will render which is expected because this is published so i have my uh, article on my next js react application but what happens if i unpublish this right so i'm just going to do that i will change this to archive and i'm going to unpublish this article now uh, as expected now since this is unpublished right any site visitor to my next js application on this article if i refresh this i should get a 403 access denied which is expected because now this is unpublished and only people who have the right permission should be seeing this article right so this is correct you have a 403 access denied but then how do editors preview this in a decoupled setup right uh, so that's where we've come up with a way where if i click on this if i'm logged into drupal i have the right roles and necessary permissions i have this special button called preview and if i click on this uh, you'll see that the page will render on my next js react application as well and the way we are doing that is we are attaching uh, when you click on this button it generates a unique hash key which you can see in the url here right so we have a unique hash key which is like a password which is unique to every node which gets generated when i click on the preview button and it's it, it, you can even set an expiration date uh, time for it. it it can refresh every 30 seconds or so right but the idea is it's a pretty seamless experience for the editors like they don't have to do anything they, they log into drupal they have a button here through which they can preview and they're able the next js application is able to make these api calls to to drupal and the api calls will only work if they have this hash key right and without it it will give an access denied so that's again some of the features and then you know 
I, I won't be able to go through every feature, but the we have a laundry list of about 15, 20 features which we've integrated with a decoupled implementation. So you can manage your menus, uh, you can control your metadata. So whatever metadata I put in my uh, meta tags module, for example, right? Uh, whatever configuration you do to your meta tags module, uh, if you are scheduling something, uh, I, you know, URL alias, even a redirect. So you can define a redirect in Drupal and it's going to work in a decoupled setup. So we have a laundry list of features that you have in a typical CMS implementation that work with a decoupled setup. So uh, yeah, of course, this is all open source. It's available on uh, Drupal.org. So if you want to check it out, please uh, go ahead. Uh, you can install this installation profile. Uh, it's called Easy Content and then if you're specifically looking for, so easy content does a lot more, like it's not only for decoupled, uh, it's a full distribution, so it has a lot of features. But if you're particularly interested in the decoupled piece, uh, you can look at easy content API, which is a separate project, which you know gives you th uh, these features. And it also has a link to a next year starter kit. So you can have the same demo site that I was showing today. You can set this up yourself as well, right? Uh, that it's on GitHub and you can have a next year's version as well. So you know this is so we went with this approach with this particular customer and uh, it it you know it, it was a happy compromise we, we believe because you know uh, both the teams were able to get what they were looking for uh, and uh, it, it you know of course this because of drupal's open architecture and you know api readiness that we were able to do this and what we would recommend is that of course if you're especially if you're going with that layout builder approach right and you want to support that kind of functionality, we would recommend having a middleware in between. So we had a middleware as well because, uh, and, and the sole purpose of the middleware was caching, you know, so that, you know, you update a layout of the page, you don't do that regularly, right? You may do it once or twice, uh, but whenever you do the cache gets refreshed, but uh, we didn't want to impact the performance of these front end pages, right? So uh, once the layout is cached in the middleware, after that, uh, your Gatsby page or your next year's page, uh, is not hitting Drupal every time to get the layout information. So that's why a middleware is recommended if you are supporting that. Uh, but if you're looking for, you know, just the other features like preview, uh, URL alias, you may not need a middleware. So that's a call that you'll have to take. Uh, but in this particular project, we did have a middleware for caching. So as I mentioned, you know, you can do this. Uh, you can check out the Easy Content API distribution. Uh, or if you're looking for individual functionality, you can look at the Access Unpublished module which will help you, uh, you know, we've extended that uh, to meet the purpose here, uh, but you can also extend it separately to get the preview functionality. And then if, if you have a use case where a progressive decoupling approach might work better for you, then you can look at the, the PDB module as well, right? So definitely check that out. And uh, the couple of uh, interesting blog posts, the first one is by Preston, you know, you should check out the whole series uh, um, where he talks about this, uh, differences and compromise between these two different uh, sort of realities in the CMS world, right? And then there's a blog post on PDB as well if you're interested in that. So with that, I'll just, you know, stop the presentation, but would be happy to jump on to any questions, comments, or anything that you would like to, anybody would like to ask. Yeah, thank you so much, Ishan. Um, somebody have a question? Could you please just put up those uh, URLs again? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me... It was the next to last slide in there? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Could you possibly copy and paste into Slack? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure people would love to check it out right now. That was really cool stuff. <laughs> I, my biggest question was the, um, the previews. Like, how much of the Gatsby and React and, and other thing, what was the other one? Uh, how much of that is just like out of the box Gatsby and React? How, how much work did you have to do to get those preview tabs going? And I guess were those tabs from one of these modules? Yeah, those, those tabs. Are, yeah, those those tabs are from the distribution. So that's part of so the that's easy part of easy content API. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yes, there there is some work that so. As far as the preview is concerned, there is not a lot of work that you have to do at the front end application. Of course. Uh, what we've done is we do we extended the JSON API, and I think there's a what what is part of EasyContent API is a, I'm forgetting the name. It's I, I think it's 
JSON API permission or something like that. I can I can follow up on that, but you do need to have some permissions on your uh, APIs, right? Uh, yeah, I think there's a content module. More, that I guess use. my question is more about how the how those the Angular apps are able to render it so quickly. Like, did you have to build those Angular apps, or is that like a real? Uh, is that final? Is that a content standard, or like a layout standard, or something? Like how? Oh no! Yeah, those, those, those are completely independent apps. So you, 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 your front end, you will have to build those, right? So. So you uh, had you so you you did have to build those. Yes, absolutely. We are not so. Okay. Uh, I know it, it's a bit confusing because in our demo side. Well, you know what I mean. I, the question, because yeah. I know that there's some automation with like GraphQL, right, and Gatsby, yeah. and I wasn't sure how much of the of yeah. those so, like so, demo front ends were just out of the box, or how much you had to do work wise. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we are using, you know, we're using some uh, material UI. Uh, we have a pattern labs project from where we're getting the UI, right? So uh, I'm, I'm sure we're using some some uh, out of the box functionality with these starter kits, right? Uh, but but the implementation is completely decoupled. So I uh, want to make clear that, you know, even though the demo side, you see the same UI on the Drupal theme and the decoupled the themes because uh, they're all getting the styling uh, CSS from a pattern labs project. but uh, the Drupal is not sending that info. So Drupal is only sending the content uh, purely as JSON API, and the front end team is completely independent in terms of how they want to build the app and what they want to do with that content. Uh, what Easy Content API is doing is, is bringing this additional information about the layout as well uh, for you to be able to use the layout builder. Very cool. Okay. Anybody have any more questions? Yeah, and I, I am on Slack. Uh, so yeah, if, you, if anybody wants to follow up, has any questions, or uh, would want to share your experience as well with the couple projects, we'd we'd be happy to you know talk about that. So. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, a muted, a muted applause from everyone. <laughs> it's my hands moving. It, but... Uh, all right, so the next talk uh, is Workflows in Drupal with Maestro um, by Jed Herzog. So I guess take it away. All right, thanks, John. And that was a great presentation. That was That was super interesting. My name is Jed Herzog. I'm going to talk about workflows in Drupal, specifically with a contributed module called Maestro. Um, you can find me on the internet as at Maestro Jed. And if you think that's confusing that my nick is Maestro Jed and the module's called Maestro, try typing Maestro Jed for you know 20 years and then have to type Maestro and not type Maestro Jed. So, um, but unaffiliated, total coincidence between my nick and, and the name of the module that I'm going to show you guys today. I'm a senior software engineer at Linkwell Health. Um, I've been working with Drupal for a long time, 12 plus years. Um, and uh, I was going to mention a little bit about Linkwell Health, where I work. We're a healthcare company that provides uh, journalism and service-based journalism in the healthcare industry. Um, so most of my coworkers and staff are journalists and writers and editors. Uh, we wrote content for most of the major uh, insurers. My role, I'm not a writer or a editor, um, is to work on the technology system on the product that we offer our clients, which is the way that they can to uh, give feedback on the clients, provide content approvals, manage your licenses. Is yeah, everyone seeing my screen? Nope. You're not seeing my screen. I apologize. I'm sorry. It's probably one last button click. One last button click. How about now? Excellent. Okay, so I'm Jed Herzog, Maestro Jed on the internet. Uh, follow me there, Jed Herzog on LinkedIn, Maestro Jed on GitHub, and uh, Drupal.org. I'm a senior software engineer at Linkwell Health, 12 plus years in Drupal, and I was speaking a little bit about Linkwell Health and what I do there. So our what I work on is the technology product that lets our clients uh, provide 
uh, editorial feedback, content approvals, manage their licensed content, and then we help distribute that. Sometimes we distribute that through microsites that we can spin up. We distribute that through REST endpoints that our clients inter, uh, integrate with. Uh, we've provided feeds for clients. It, it really depends on how they want to ingest the client, uh, the content into their systems. Uh, my product is completely built on Drupal. I build it as, or we build it as a hub and spoke model, which means there's a single Drupal site that our team works within. That's what we call the hub. We manage and create all our content, our workflows, our approvals, all that type of stuff in the hub. The spokes are those microsites where the clients uh, are able to interact with that feedback and then even use those microsites as distribution. So enough about Linkwell. I wanna talk about workflows and specifically Maestro. This first bolded line here is from Wikipedia and it's work, a workflow consists of an orchestrated and repeatable pattern of activity. Um, I like that. and. You know, I think of a workflow as anything that you do that takes more than one step. Um, that's a workflow, and that could be flow charted and, and derived into a workflow. And there's workflows built into Drupal um, all over the place. And I've listed a few just to kind of illustrate. One, a workflow could be so simple. Um, for example, when you're working on an entity, a content type, and you add a new field, immediately after saving that field, you're taken to that field settings page. Um, the field's already created. You don't have to do anything on that settings page, but the designers of that flow realized that would be the most common next step you will want to do. So they created a workflow and, and you create this, the field and then you set the settings. A more complex workflow would be Drupal's installation process where you you go through many multiple steps to install Drupal first. Uh, it does some system checks, then it asks you for some database credentials. It does the installation. And finally, it's gonna ask you for some basic site install data. Um, so examples of how of what a workflow is. Um, I just wanna take a moment and acknowledge that Drupal 8 and above ships with a workflows module. Um, this is the definition of that module. It is uh, provides a user interface to create workflows with transitions between different states provided by other modules. My presentation is not about that module. In fact, I have limited experience with that module. And so if you're watching this and you have experience with that module, I'd love to have a conversation and learn how Maestro and the workflow modules in core are similar. Um, briefly, I believe workflows modules is very, uh, as it says in that definition, based on different states of content where Maestro can do that, but, but really can do a lot more. So with no further ado, let's talk about Maestro. This is Maestro's uh, slogan, and it's a pretty fun one. It's, if it can be flow charted, then it can be automated with Maestro. And so far, I have found that to be true. I want to show you a couple of uh, resources. This is the project on drupal.org um, slash maestro, project slash maestro. Um, I'll point out briefly, I'm working on the eight. Uh, the 2.1 branch, and you can see that we've got a 3.x uh, branch coming soon. I want to show you their documentation page. If anybody's a developer and had to write documentation, you know how hard that can be, and you also know the pleasure that comes from finding a project that has good documentation. And so I wanted to compliment these guys, these maintainers. There's extensive documentation for this module online. You can learn a lot. There's videos, there's so many ways to really get into Maestro. Take advantage of that. They've done a really good job with this documentation. And by them, I mean the sponsor maintainer, which is a company called Nextide. And I felt it was important to say I'm not affiliated with Nextide. I haven't had a conversation with Nextide, uh, but they do support this module and they have for quite a while in Drupal. And I believe they've built a very nice uh, consultancy and Drupal agency um, helping companies with business processes that require workflows. So uh, thanks, next time. They've created this website here, which is a fake insurance company that lets you walk through getting insurance quotes and all kinds of different stuff like that, all obviously using Maestro workflows and demonstrating how you could turn your Drupal website into more of a web application using complex workflows. So again, another resource to learn Maestro, I highly recommend you take advantage of.
Okay, I want to jump into an example. Um, the most common example you hear of in workflows is content moderation, and I realize that. Maestro is not limited by content moderation, and I think you'll see as we go through the example the different ways that you could use Maestro for whatever workflows your users or your web application needs. But for simplicity, I'm going to envision a content moderation workflow. So I want us all to envision we have two roles, an author and an editor. The author has the right to create a new article, but once they've created that new article, an editor must approve it. If the editor approves that article, then the process is complete. If the, if the editor does not approve the article, then the article has to go back to the author for revisions. So that's the basic example I want to start with as we start looking at the Maestro module. Let's keep that in mind. There's a few things I've already done on my Drupal install. And I want to just show you those real quick. Um, give me one second here to get spun up. OK, great. So I've already created those two roles I spoke of. Um, I have an author role. I have an editor role. I've assigned what permissions you might expect. The author has the right to create new articles. Uh, the editor has the right to review unpublished articles, stuff like that. I've also created a couple of users. I've created an author who I called Author Adam. And I created two editors. I've got Editor Gwen and Editor Ed that I will be using in this demonstration. Additionally, I've installed a module called Masquerade. I've used Masquerade a lot. If you haven't run across it, I didn't want to make my demo about it. But it's this awesome little module that lets you switch between users on the fly. It's amazing for demonstrations. It can also be helpful in debugging why one user is having an odd experience compared to another. Um, but a very cool module, and I will be using that. So that is what I've already done on my standard uh, Drupal install. To install Maestro, we're going to use Composer. It's taking just a second to complete here, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have success. And that we did. So back to my Drupal site, I'm going to enable it through the UI and not through the command line so that we can see the different modules that Maestro ships with. There's quite a few it comes with. You're going to want to use the Maestro engine. That provides the API everything Maestro uses. The task console I'm going to enable, that provides a nice page and a view for users to see what tasks are currently assigned to them. I'm going to enable the template builder. That's the UI tool that we're going to use to build our workflows in a flow chart manner. I'm also going to enable the utility functions. We're not going to use a lot of these in this demonstration, but you will see them listed when I create new tasks. It, it adds more types of tasks. So I want those to be there so that you could see them. Um, there is also a web forms integration. I haven't worked with a lot. I'm not enabling that. I won't need it for this demonstration. But you will see do, through my demo that I'm building multiple forms so you can envision how web forms has integrated into Maestro. You can also see they ship with a number of examples. So again, with the documentation, that insurance website, you know, there's so many great resources to learn from, hopefully this presentation too. Um, but uh, you can install those and learn how to do different things. For now, I'm going to install those four uh, modules I've checked. And once these install, we're going to have to do just a little bit of basic configuration on the admin configuration page, which is where I'm going next. So on the admin configuration page, 
we now have uh, a section called workflow and I'm going to look at the admin settings. Um, you get to choose the route for that task console that we enabled. That's the page that's going to let users know what task is assigned to them. It, I want to call out this option here. Um, you're going to see that more as I throw, show the demo. But for any task in your workflow, you're able to send out notifications to the people that are assigned to it that they have a new task. I'm enabling the orchestrator. The orchestrator is what moves one task from the other. So it evaluates any open task to see if it's been completed. Um, it, and I'm running it so that every time you go to the task console, it checks to see if any of the tasks have been updated. And uh, let's just give this uh, a unique token. And save those. The other setting on the configuration page is inconsequential. It lets you load the libraries that are used in the UI um, from either a CDN um, here. So we don't need to worry about that. And the final step would be to look at some basic permissions now so that we can allow our different types of users to use Maestro. Maestro is very granular in its permissions, and I'm not going to speak to each one that we find in this uh, panel, but I will tell you what I'm going to enable. I'm going to allow our users to start a new process, and every permission of lower level under that. If you guys had questions about these specific permissions, I'd be glad to try to, to talk through them. Um, but as you can see, it's very granular and, and who it gets control and who does not. Okay, so now that we've installed our module, we've enabled it, we've uh, done the basic configuration and the permissions for it. And it is time to start a demonstration. So again, let's walk through our example. We've got an author who's allowed to create content but that content must be approved or possibly rejected by an editor. And if it's rejected, it's going to go back to the author. If it's approved, process is done. So to build this, the first thing we need to do is create that task that is going to ask an author to create a new article and is going to be assigned to that author. So now that Maestro is installed, I've got a new uh, menu item here. And you can see the task console I mentioned is a page to see which tasks are assigned to you. We haven't created any tasks, so nothing's going to be there. Template Builder is where I'm headed right now. Maestro ships again with another example already pre-installed. We're going to make our own. So adding a template is a workflow. A template is the entire process of your workflow. So I'm going to call this one Content Moderation. The canvas size, you're going to see that I'm building this flowchart in a UI, and that canvas size relates to that. Um, the number of stages, some of your workflow steps might be logical steps where you're not asking for any user in interaction. So if you had a workflow that maybe was 10 steps long, but five of them were logical, you wouldn't want to inform the user that this was a 10-step workflow. In reality, the user is only going to interact with about five steps. So we call those stages, and that's what this is here for. So you would say there's only five stages in this workflow, even though there's 10 steps. And you'd be able to define along the way when you fit one of those stages. Variables, you're able to create as many variables as you need that will be maintained throughout this workflow. So if you need to pass on information from one task to another, maybe about a user that's been assigned the content or the content ID or, or whatever you can envision, whatever data you need to pass along, you can create variables here and set them. For this basic example so far, I don't need to do that. So I now have a workflow called content moderation. I'm going to click on task editor to begin creating the steps in this workflow. You can see every workflow begins with start and it finishes with end. And so that's the basic workflow we start with, but we're ready to get busy building that first task, asking an author to create an article. Um, so 
I click add task. This task is to create a new article. Of these different types, you can see the, no the types of tasks that ship out of the box. And I'm going to talk about some of these, or most of these, maybe not all, but most of these. In this situation, we're going to choose the content type task because we're creating a brand new uh, entity of a content type. Once you create the task, it puts it on the canvas for you. But there's typically more settings you're going to have to configure by going to the hamburger menu and choosing edit task. So now that I've done that, in my task to create a new article, I'm able to limit that to a certain type of content or a content type, a bundle. And I'm going to give it an ID. This ID is important because this piece of content this author is creating is going to be the same content item we're going to ask the editor to review. And so we need an ID to know which node we're talking about. And that ID I'm going to call new article. We've got a few options here. This one allows this user when they're exercising or executing this task to go to the edit page of the node instead of the view page. And that's perfect for an author who's going to be creating a new node. I'm sorry, that's this checkbox, um, the second checkbox. The first checkbox allows that author to save a draft without saving the node fully and completing the task. So you can imagine an, an author who has a long story to write is going to write it over multiple nights before they want to send it to that editor. And this final checkbox is do you want to show accept or reject buttons? In this case, the author is not accepting or rejecting. They're just creating content. So we don't want to show those. I'm not checking it. Once the author does this, I'm going to send them back to their task console. I think that makes sense. Down here is who is going to do this task. And you have a number of options. The fixed values you get to choose from, is it a user specifically or is it a role? And in my situation, it's neither. I want the person who's going to start this entire workflow to be the person who has to do the task. So I'm envisioning author Adam is going to click a button that says, I want to create an article. And they're going to be assigned this first task, which is to create that article. So the second option here is by variable. Remember those variables we could set? They would all show up here. Um, but by default, there's some variables that always come with the process. And the initiator of the process is one of those. So I'm going to say whoever is kicked off this process has to be the one to do this first task. The notifications I mentioned earlier, this allows you to send that user a notification. You can send them a message right when it's assigned. You can have a reminder that's set X many days afterwards and an escalation that again is set X many days afterwards. And you can customize those messages here. I'm not going to fire off emails for this demonstration, uh, but I wanted you to know that those were available. OK, so my first task is now created. My second task is for an editor to review this article. So I'm going to add a second task. I'm going to call this one review. Again, we're still working with the content type. And my new task is here. Again, more options once I click the hamburger and I edit this task. Again, it's the same content type. And we're going to give it the exact same ID that we gave the first task so that it will be the same node that was created in task one that's shown here. In this situation, the editor wants to review the article. So they, um, they don't need to save a draft. They don't need to link to the edit page. They should link to the view page. So I'm not checking any of those. But we are asking them to accept or reject. Once they've done that, I'm going to take them back to their task console. Who is supposed to do this? An editor. That's a role, not a specific person. So in this case, we can assign it by a fixed value of role. 
and choose the editor. And again, I'm not going to send off any emails in this demonstration. So looking at our plan, we have now done steps one and two of our build. We've created an article or created a task to create an article. We've made a task to review that article. And the last task is to evaluate whether that editor approved or rejected the article. So I'm going to add a new task. And I'm going to call this one if approved. And this, I'm going to just use an if statement. So this is one of those logical steps I mentioned um, that you might have in your workflows. Again, hamburger and edit task to, to fill in a few more of the, the details of this task. Here you're evaluating something. It's an if statement. It could be one of the variables you've set, um, which we haven't done much of. Um, but you can also evaluate by the status of the last task. In that last task, we exposed the accept and reject buttons. So this is a perfect time to use uh, by last task status. OK, so if I look back at my plan, these were the three tasks that I felt I needed to create in my workflow. So now I just need to link them together. Right now, we're going straight from start to finish. If you click on these, you can remove the lines. And we can draw out our new workflow. So we want to start. We want to go to create a new article. Then we want to go to review that article. Then we want to go to the if statement. And then notice here, on these options, you only have the option to draw a line two. But when you have an if statement, you get the option to draw a line two and to draw your false line to also. So the accept, the positive draw line to would end this process. But if it's rejected, it has to go back to that author. I think kind of uh, using the UI since they provide it makes a little bit of sense. So this is kind of the workflow that we envisioned. The last step in building a workflow, you can see I'm getting a warning up here that I have not validated this workflow. And that's this button here. And that just goes through a number of checks and make sure that you configured all those settings in each tab, in each task that were required, that you draw on your lines in a way that makes sense. This warning here is perfectly fine. It's letting us know that we have a little bit of a circular workflow that could never end. Um, but that's exactly how we've designed it. So. So we have now built our first workflow, and I'm ready to demo this process to you guys. Um, to do that, I'm going to take a couple of asides here. One, I'd like to add a couple of items to my menu just to make this demonstration go smoother from here on out. And I uh, hope you do, guys don't mind. One of the items I'm going to link to is the task console. The other one, I forgot to copy the link, is the, the way you start one of these workflows that we just built. So we built it in the, the template builder under Maestro template builder. Here it is. This is where we built it. And in this contextual menu, you can also start this process. Um, but that's a little clunky of a way, in my opinion, for a user to start the process. So I'm going to just copy that link and add it to my menu. I'm also adding a destination. Oh, I see what I've done here. So when they go here, they will be creating a new article. That's the process I'm linking them to, and I'm hitting save. So I hope that wasn't confusing. All I did was add a couple of items here to make my life easier. Um, setting permissions. Fortunately, we don't have to do that, but I do want to show you something. Now that we have created 
our first process, I want you to see that it is listed in the permissions now. So for every workflow you create, you get to choose the permissions that accomplish it or complement it. And I think that's important. I'm going to go ahead and grant these here. Um, but I had also granted the global start any process permission, so I didn't need to do that. But I think it's important for you guys to know that. All right. So you guys are ready to see the process. So I'm going to click create a new article, create a new article. All right. So I click create a new article. That spawned up the workflow, create a new article. I'm on my task console. Um, sorry. I executed this as an administrator. I meant to execute this as a author. Uh, that was always our envisioning or the process we envisioned was that an author would create a new article. So I'm going to use this masquerade feature that I've talked about a few times. And I'm going to start typing author. And I see author Adam, that user I created. I'm going to switch that author. All right. Sorry for that false start. As Adam, let's create a new article. I'm the one that created this process. So I'm the one the first task is assigned for. That's as designed. When I execute this task to create a new article, it takes me to the content creation page. Um, and it allows us to create that article. Now, let's give this a chance to load. You can see now that I, as author Adam, completed the first step, I have no more tasks to complete. My task console is empty because that task is now moved to an editor. So I'm going to unmasquerade as Adam, and I'm going to masquerade as one of my editors, editor Gwen. Now that I'm Gwen, if I go to my task console, I see I have a task assigned to me to review an article. If I execute my task, I'm taken to that same article the author created. You can see the same title, the same body, and it even references the uh, author. So now I'm able to review it. And in this case, I'm going to reject it first. So if I reject it, I have no more tasks to do because I'm an editor and I've reviewed the only article uh, that was in queue. But if I unmasquerade and I go back as the author, so I'm going back as Adam, the original author, and I look at their task console, they do indeed now have a task that says, uh, you know, this is something you might want to work on, have to say review a new article. But when you hit execute, we're now taken to the edit page of that exact same node that was originally created. I can now make my revisions as the author and hit save. We're in that circle. So you know, I'm going to move fast a little, a little bit fast here, but I'm going to go back as Gwen now and review that article one last time. Here's my task. And this time I'm going to accept this article. And what you'll notice is I have no more task. And to prove this out, I'll go back as Adam and he shouldn't have any task either. And he doesn't. So that seems like success. We were able to create the process that we envisioned and run through it. I wanted to show, I'm going to unmasquerade and go back as an administrator. Under the Maestro tab, there is a workflow history, an all active task history, and an, all, and an outstanding task. These are great views for you to see what's going on in the system and to see what's happened. So in that case, in that um, example I just ran through, you can see it was completed. You can click trace and you can see all the steps that were taken in completing that workflow. So as an administrator or a project manager, you get a lot of insight as to where people are at in the workflows you assigned to them or that you're expecting to be complete. So that is 
my the basic example using the UI that ships with Maestro. Um, I am prepared to show you a few more uh, complex examples where you get into some custom work. I'll pause for just a second to see if anybody wants to raise their hand uh, with any questions or any comments. Yeah, I have a quick question. I assume this this works with any um, any node in the system. The, that content type task should work with any type of node in the system. Um, and if you were trying to work with some other sort of entity, uh, you might have to start working with either these interactive tasks, which I want to show you next, or create your own task, and then the sky's the limit. Um, okay. Yeah. So in um. I think it was D7, or might even be even back in D6. We had where where one user would upload a file, and then the second user would go in and, and massage that data, and then send it back to the first user to augment and so forth. Yeah. And that when we put our own workflow, but if this does this, that means I can you know make a big jump in what I'm doing now because I built something in in D8. That yeah. Leads I I think so. I think you could definitely use this for that. You know, I'm envisioning just that same type of thing where you, you, you keep modifying the same node based on that unique ID over and over again. Um, so you're just passing, you know, the first person uploads the file, you're passing the same node onto the second. Um, and you well, can get sophisticated with checks and stuff like that. But I definitely think this would work. So work I, I don't know if you remember what I did a few weeks ago. I did um, a couple about a month ago. I did my opposite. So someone uploads a CSV. Mm -hmm. And then the second person, data manager, properly massages the data and names it the way they want it named. And then we place it back in as now a new type of data for the first person to go in and augment it. So they're not going to touch the file again, but they just get they just get their data up and their images because most of them have no idea what data is. You know, most people out there are clueless. Yeah. Yeah, I... You know, I don't know that you're going to get everything out of the box, but I also know you, and I think you don't mind getting into the code a little bit. No, you can create yeah. you can create custom tasks. And the next thing I was going to show you is that you know they kind of give you two different levels. So you can create a custom callback, which is what this interactive interactive task is next. But you then also can create your own very own task that can do just anything you can envision. So um, and and the flowchart's wonderful. I mean, I just. We had a version that, not the flow chart, but we had to manually go in and arrange what things get done in what order. Yeah. You know, as, as a backend developer, I didn't know how I felt about that UI when I first ran across it. But building tools, you know, it kind of goes back into the first presentation of, you know, building tools for your marketers, building tools for different parts of your team. You can, as a backend developer, create a lot of tasks that your team might need and you can allow, you know, somebody who's not an engineer or is not a background developer to create their own workflows using that UI, uh, which is pretty cool. And I've definitely come around on thinking that the UI is pretty neat. Um, do, do, they, <clears throat> do they have any good tutorials? For, for my, the my um, yeah, the tutorials are awesome for Meister. A lot of good documentation. Yeah. Um, there's that insurance page. They ship with example modules. Um, so lots of ways to get into it there. I mean, I'm going to play back your, your presentation again, just to get you know, a second scope on it. But uh, it's, it's, look, this looks awesome. Yeah, cool. That's great. I hope you do. Let me know how it goes, please. Okay. Were there any other questions or comments before I show how to create an interactive callback? Well, let's do it. Um, okay, so the next part of my example, I just want to extend the idea that we had originally. Um, originally, the author was assigning the content to the role editor to be reviewed. Now I want to envision that they need to assign it to a very specific person. You know, maybe their boss, or or uh, we're going to assume the author knows who they want to assign it to. So that task we now need a task where the author gets to choose a, a user and we also need a variable now to save that information into so back to my example the first thing i'm going to do is add that variable to hold that data of who the which editor is going to review the article i'm going to edit my template 
This was the first thing we set up when we built when we started this template. These are the variables that come with every single Maestro process. I'm going to create a new one. Give me one second. Let me go to my notes and see what I want to call it. I'm going to call it assigned to. Okay. So looking at my plan, I have now added a variable in order to, to save the assigned to information into. So now what I need is a task to select a user. When I click on this, I don't know that any of these tasks let me select a user. Um, so it seems like something we're going to have to build on our own. do this, I'm going to use the interactive task. Okay, so it's added my task to my canvas. And I'm going to look at my options now. So the most unique option in this task is the call for a handler. So this is where we get to now go into the back end and write our own callback and provide it here to complete this task. So and I ran through this demonstration on my own last night. I made a typo, and I decided I'm no longer going to type out this example. And I'm going to just show you guys the code. Bear with me for one second. I think because I manually installed that. Because I manually installed. Whew, sorry about that, guys. All right. So this is my code base, my site, and I now have a custom module that I'm started, and I named it Drupal NYC underscore Maestro. The info file is your standard Drupal module. So I'm not going to go into too much of that, but I want to show you the code that's required to create one of these custom callbacks or handlers, as they call it. This hook is the meat of it. Uh, this is hook maestro interactive handlers. Since maestro is in my module name, it's a little funky, but um, you know it's hook maestro interactive handlers. And here, this is the callback function um, that also needs to exist in this module file. And this is the name of your task. So this is the callback I'm defining, which should be a Drupal form. And you can see, indeed, the next uh, my, uh, function I define here is that form. I'm using, it's a little different than Drupal's form API because I'm inheriting the maestro form that's already coming in, um, but I inherit that and then I can extend that form however I need. Now the idea of my task is to ask the author to choose an, uh, another user to review their content. So I'm creating a form field for that, which is called the reviewer. And I'm using, you know, just a little bit of uh, form API here. Uh, it's built in to do a entity type of user uh, 
uh, like Ajax callback. Um, so I'm going to use that here. I, the only other field I'm adding to that form is a hidden field to pass along the QID to the submit handler. I find that handy, and I also see the Maestro module doing that quite often, so I've kind of uh, monkey see, monkey do, uh, feeling that it's a good idea to pass that QID along in my form. I've also overridden the label on the submit button. Instead of saying submit, I wanted to say assign because that's what we're doing. Once this form is submitted, I also get to define the submit handler. And here I'm just gathering some information from the form. Specifically, I'm gathering that Q uh, ID that I passed along and I'm loading this process. The process is the workflows, the maestro process. Um, so I'm loading that from the Q ID uh, so that I have a uh, scope in the entire workflow. But this is really just the meat of the handler right here. I'm just taking the form. I'm seeing who they chose, which user they chose. I'm loading that user because I've learned from experience that Maestro is going to assign things by the user name, not by the UID. So that's why I'm loading the user and then gathering the user name. I then, using the Maestro uh, method, set process variable. This is that variable that I defined on the template just a few minutes ago. So now I'm going to be able to set a value to it, and I'm setting the username of whoever was chosen, and it's being assigned to this entire process, which is why I needed to gather that process information up here. Um, you know, this is very unnecessary, but just a little bit of feedback. So, you know, 80 lines of code here. Really, you're just defining a form, uh, a form submit handler, and you're listing that form as a callback. Pretty easy. So. I probably should clear my cache. I assume that will finish. And now this is that interactive task that I added, but I, I, you know, I diverged and showed you guys the code. So now when I go into this edit task in the handlers, hopefully. These two ship with Maestro's module. I'm not seeing mine yet. Hmm. I'm going to refresh this page, double check a few things. I know what I did. We just created a new module, but I have not enabled it. So let me go to the extend page and enable that custom module that we just want or just reviewed. There it is. And now it's installed. Back to the template builder, Maestro and template builder back to our workflow content moderation and back to editing that interactive task and no whammies. Here we go. That is the callback I just defined. You could choose whether to show this in a, a modal pop-up or a full page. And the last task is who's supposed to do this? Who's supposed to assign this to an editor? And the answer is still the initiator. So it's that same author, the initiator. So we now have an interactive task where the author gets to choose which editor. The last thing we need to do, this is the task we had previously that is for the author to review the article, but it's assigned to a role. See? It's assigned to the role editor. We no longer want to do that. We now want to assign it to the person chosen in the step before. So first, I'm going to delete this. We don't want to assign it to this role anymore. And then I'm going to go down to the assignment pane. 
I'm going to assign it by variable. And here is that variable that I misspelled on the template. Let me go fix that real quick. Assign to. Assign does not have an E. I don't. Okay. Sorry about that. So, again, this is the task. The editor's reviewing and who's supposed to do it. The person in that variable. So, variable and assign to. Doesn't seem to have updated. Again, all I'm doing right this second is, is trying to correct my typo. Let me clear my cache, guys. Sorry about the typo. I'm just going to delete that variable and add it again. All right, the variable name review article edit. We do not want it assigned to the initiator. We want it assigned to the variable assigned to. Double check. Okay, that looks correct now. Sorry for that confusion. But remember back in our module, when we get the person selected, we put it into the assigned to variable and making a mess there. assigned it to after multiple typos we have now updated that task i'm just confirming user variable assigned to perfect so we need to fix our flow here these lines are not drawn correctly um, you can remove the lines and then redraw as you need to so after the author creates a new article they need to assign it to an editor. After that, the editor needs to review. And after that, we are going to evaluate whether the author approved or rejected. If it's rejected, we go back to the circle. And if it's approved, we end the process. So now that we have this workflow created using our own custom callback in this interactive task, I can check my validity and everything works out. So I should now be able to run through this process for you guys. I'm looking back at our slide. We've done the two things we have planned to build. So it is just time to run through the process. I'm going to go in as the author. I'm going to fire off a new process for creating a ta an article. I'm going to execute it and create my second article in the system. Now, I still have a task on my task console and on the author where previously I did it. Uh, my task now is different from creating a new article. My task is to assign this article to an editor. So this is the interactive task we just built in code with a handler. I'm going to execute it. You can see the form has only one field just as I built. That field is the reviewer field. It's a callback that lets me autocomplete. I'm going to assign it to Gwen, editor Gwen. Now that I've assigned it to Gwen, it's Gwen's problem, and I no longer have a task on my console. If I unmask RAID, 
Before I go in as Gwen, let's go in as Ed because Ed should not see this task. It was not assigned to him, even though he's an editor. And sure enough, Ed does not see the task. But when we go in as Gwen, Gwen does see the task. Gwen has the task to review the article. We've seen this part before. They get to view the second article. You can see that it's referenced in the right node. Uh, they could reject it and send it back to the author. Um, I'm going to go ahead and accept it um, unless you guys really want to be to prove out that the circle, uh, the circular approval process would work. So that's extending our idea and showing you guys how you can easily, by just creating Drupal forms, create callbacks that can really extend the possibilities of what Maestro can do. Um, before I go any further with that, is there any questions or comments so far? Great. Um, my last example, the most ex advanced example, would be the idea of creating completely custom tasks. So not that interactive task with a callback, but something you've envisioned that's very unique to your web application. Um, the way I'm going to extend my example here is... Uh, what if the author doesn't want to write a new article, but they want to choose an article maybe they wrote a year ago and refresh it? They would need the ability not just to create a new article, but the first, they should be prompted, do you want to create a new article or do you want to select an existing article? And if they want to ex select an existing article, we need to allow them some sort of form to be able to do that. So this is the custom task i'm going to build and i'm not going to use a handler you saw the handler where i provided a form that just lets you choose a user so maybe you're thinking well why don't you provide just a form to let you choose a piece of content and you could probably do that i'm trying to complicate my life to give you guys a nice demonstration here um, so i'm going to do it completely as a custom task Okay, so let me look at my slide. To do this, we're gonna do a few things. Oh. My plan is, first of all, to add another variable, and this variable is gonna store the content ID that is assigned to be edited. And then I need to build the task, which is gonna ask the author, is this a new or an existing article? And I'm going to show you the code to do that. To build a custom task in Maestro, you're going to create a plugin. And that goes in your source directory, into the plugins directory after that, and then a directory called engine task. You can see I've created an engine task called Maestro select content task. And this is what it looks like. I'm going to walk through and explain these, but maybe not read every line of code. You know, interrupt if you have any questions. Um, we, we go through some construct, but really we're going to start defining, yes, this is an interactive task that we need the user to do something. It's not a logical task. We provide a short description, a long description of this task. We give it a unique ID. The colors are... Um, let me go back and pull up. I unmasqueraded to go back as the administrator. So the colors are the, the colors you see on here. And you can see like right now, the different types of tasks have different colors. So you get to define your own color for your task. And then you're going to really create two forms. The first is a task edit form. This is the form for when you choose this hamburger and you choose edit. Like what settings and configuration does the user need to provide to be able to set this task? And in my situation, I'm going to let them define a content type. So when you're selecting it, you can say only select articles or only select basic pages. I'm going to ask for a unique ID so that once the content is selected, we can follow it. 
I'm going to ask that redirect question, where does the user want to go after they've completed this task? And I'm doing that really because that's on all Maestro tasks, so it just makes sense. And then that same question, do you want to load this in a modal window or do you want to load it in its own window? So that's you know very basic. Again, just form API, creating a form for the configuration uh, pane. You can validate and make sure anything that's required is in that form. And then this is the task that's going to save that, that data into the Maestro process. So whatever you've configured in this box gets saved through this prepare task for save method. Jed, so, could, could you, um, because some people on the call might be real noobs or early, you know, beginning. So you understand what, what you were doing with Git when you were checking out while you're switching the code the code around they may not understand okay the, the method behind that yeah sorry about that guys I, you know like i said last night i ran through this and I, originally at least for the first example i was going to type it all out and I, I was making too many typos so with git all i did was i prepared uh a couple of the different stages in my demonstration uh, and i saved them as tags within git so these were the tags i i saved you can see where i started Extended one was my first example and extended two was my second example. So by checking out those GIF, different Git tags, it's popping code in into my project, which I'm now showing you. So that's all. This was code I wrote a few days ago. I saved it in Git as a tag, and now I'm just popping it in there to save a little bit of time and hopefully not make more typos. <laughs> Does that work, Scott? So you're basically extending yeah, basically you're ex extending um, Maestro to do what you want to do, and rather than having two different demos, having to retype it, you're just like switching the code out, you know, like they might have done with FTP. True, exactly. And and we haven't really, you know, we've continued to build along the same example. So in the first extension, we built the module where we had the module file and we had a procedural uh, handler and callback, right? So we did this in example one, and that's all still here. When I checked out example two, all I really did was plop in this file here, which is a uh, Drupal plugin. Um, so Scott, we're, I didn't like throw away the first example. I've continued to build on it all along, if that makes sense. Okay, so back to this example. So we talked about the task and the task save. That's the configuration. Um, this execute function is interesting. It executes only the first time uh, this task is run. There's some tasks that you'll want to be able to have run multiple times and some tasks you're only going to want to run once. And so this is easy. This is kind of a nice method to be able to uh, deal with that type of functionality. The get ex executionable form method is the meat of the task. This is what you're providing to your user to do. In our case, we're asking them in this form field, are you choosing an existing article or are you creating a new article? From that, I've got a few more fields. This is the form if they've said that they want to select an existing field and it's only shown this state part here of the form API only shows this part of the form if they have indeed said that they want to select an existing article. And is there anything? This query here is just getting articles to show them. It's a simple query. I'm just getting all articles. Um, the QID I said before, I, I pass it along. I think it's good practice. And then this is if they chose that they want to create a new article. Um, I'm loading an entity form here for them to do that. And this is a little bit tr uh, trickery, but basically I'm, I'm extending a maestro form. So all I'm doing here is I'm gathering the entity form. I'm being very specific to get it for a certain form display. And then I'm adding those components to this maestro form. Um, you know, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, you can ask me questions about that specifically. Um, I've got my submit handler. 
I'm asking, uh, or if it's a modal, then this is to handle that. So that is the form that is displayed to the end user to execute the task. And then this is the handler. And the handler just comes in. If it's a new article, I'm going to save that article. I'm going to set that article into a variable called new article. I'm going to bound that article to this process by creating an identity uh, identifier. And then I'm going to complete the task. If it was not a new article, if it was an existing article, I'm going to get that NID, that node ID. I'm going to save that into that same variable. You know, that's the same variable up here, new article. So that we're using the same variable either way. Save that NID there. I'm going to uh, complete that task. I'm going to bound that entity to this process. And that's it. In this situation, this is a little weird. I, I don't want to diverge, but if the user was to click cancel and not complete the task, this allows them to cancel out the process without moving forward. This validity check method is, you know, you see me have to click this validity check button here to make sure any required settings are set and the lines are all drawn. So you can add to that functionality here to make things sure things are configured as they are supposed to be. And finally, what UI tools are needed for this type of task? You know, the ability to draw lines, the ability to edit, remove lines, remove the task completely. We don't need the ability to draw false lines or anything like that. So that is walking through the, that very quickly. I'm almost out of time here. Um, so I'm going to try to go fast and hope this works. Deal, bear with me for one second while I pull up my notes. All right. So now if I add a new task, This has not shown up. I think I probably should clear my cache. I have not done that since I plopped that new class into Drupal. Woohoo! There's my new task. Let's give it a so this is the task we just created it did not exist before I'm gonna add it in here now this task is actually going to replace this task but first let's go and look at the edit settings so I'm gonna click the hamburger and click edit this is the form we defined under let me go to the structure of this class under get task edit form. That's this form. We're going to limit the articles. We're going to give it the unique ID, new article. Go back to the task console. And we're going to want the initiator to do this also. So the person who kicks it off. So now I can remove this task. So the first step now is select or create. And then we assign it to the editor. And I'm going to do my validity check. I've got a problem. What did I do here? Ah, my false line is missing. So. You know, that's not true. I, I didn't. We need one more task here. Because if they select it, then they assign it to the editor. If the editor was to reject it, so it comes here and it's rejected, it needs to go back to the author. But the author doesn't need to select and create again. 
what they're going to need to do is review or uh, revise. This is just the content type now. So. And that goes back to the author who initiated this whole game. Speaking of the UI, sometimes that the JavaScript of all that gets messed up. I, I just refresh so that I can fix that. Okay. So our process starts. The author has to select or create a new article, assign it to an editor. The editor has to approve or reject. If it's rejected, that, then they just need to revise the article. And then they need to assign it back to the editor. The editor needs to approve or reject. If it's approved, it ends. Again, this is just telling us we're being a little circular here, and that's perfectly fine. Um, let's see how quickly I can run through this. I know it is eight o'clock. Sorry, I need to be an author. So it says select or create a new article. I select that, I execute that, and I get this form that I built in the get executionable form method here, which is asking me, do I want to choose an existing article or create a new article? And you can see my form API is working. You can see my list of articles here. So if I want to revise, um, sorry, hit refresh. All right, so I'm going to say revise. That's something we haven't done yet. So let's revise that very first article that we wrote. You can see my next task is to assign that to the editor, and I'm going to do Gwen again. I have no more task. I'm going to go back in as Gwen. Review. And I think you could tell by now it's working. We're reviewing that first article that we selected instead of created. I'm going to hit accept unless you guys really want me to reject it and go through that circle. So. That is the advanced example where I've created my own task. And I hope that that inspires you to think that, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, whatever task you can envision that goes along with your workflows or with your web app is possible in Maestro. Um, I'm out of time. The last few slides, I was going to talk about real world examples of how I've used workflow. Uh, you guys can ask me in the Q&A to do that anyways if you're really interested. Um, but there's examples of how I've used it at my job at Linkwell Health and the type of workflows we've created. Um, and then this is a project I worked on for uh, a long time years ago in Drupal 7, which was a web-based HR superv supervisory web app that was all based on Maestro and had very complex workflows. And I'd be glad to explain that. Um, my last few miscellaneous points I wanted to tell you guys these template processes you create in the template builder are config entities, which I think is really awesome that you can export them, uh, especially because sometimes they can get complex to build. So, you know, you can export them. I like to track my changes um, so, and stuff like that. I mentioned earlier when we looked at the project page, 3.x is coming soon. That orchestrator that moves tasks along and evaluates whether they are complete or not runs every time you go to the task console if you check that config box. But you can also run it on its own cron, which I suggest I run it quite often. Um, and then the last thing is, even though the UI comes with the ability to or built in task, what I have found in real world applications is that users get annoyed if they have to do 10 
little tiny tasks strung together. So like create this, now assign that, now do this, now do that. It gets annoying. And that's a, an opportune time for you to step back. Don't use the built-in task and create your own task that maybe can accomplish two or th three of those things all at once. Um, and that's just something I found while working with workflows. And that's it. I'm done. It's 8.05 and I really appreciate you guys' time. Um, and I'm available for any questions you might have. Great presentation, Jed. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jed, real quick, um, you said you've used this in real world places. After you know hundreds or thousands of workflows, what kind of cruft does this leave behind? Are these all those logging things? Are they entities or are they whatever? And can you get rid of them? You know. Um, Yes. So, you know, I haven't run the cross where I have hundreds of workflows created, but certainly, you know, the number of people executing them, um, they are their own entities. So you don't have to worry about them cramming up the node table or anything like that. You can delete a process completely. Um, so some of these, especially the ones I accidentally kicked off when I was the administrator. Um, if you come into trace, you have a delete button. So this is going to wipe out that entire process completely. Um, so you can remove those from the system. They are their own entities. I have not run across an issue where, you know, it really clogged me up or became an issue. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah. That was awesome. Cool. And, uh, so those are the two main presentations we had today. Uh, didn't have anything else scheduled, um, but uh, you know, there's always fun to be had later. So maybe people John, you're a bit low. Am I too low? Now you uh, better. Yeah. <clears throat> so turn myself up here. Um, the next meetup will be next Wednesday, September 2nd. Uh, I think you can see. Oh, no, I need to re present. Hold on. Sorry. Or am I still presenting? It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, we can see it. It's just, uh, it's not like the main slide, but I think you can pin oh, awesome. it. To make so it we already better. have yep. uh, the scheduled talks for next month, too. Um, Oliver Davies is going to show upgrading the Drupal 9. And um, Michael Schmidt is, this is a great session I saw at DrupalCon, his best and worst strategies for dealing with high demand work. So uh, just a general, really, really cool insight to a guy that has like 10 jobs. <laughs> How he seems so chill all the time. Uh, Michael Schmidt. So uh, yeah, join us next month. Um, please come talk to us. Uh, uh, again, ask people that are giving interesting talks. See, hey, we have a meetup every month. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, and that's it. And I, I, I saw Neil post something about the events calendar. So I thought we might as well point that out in the Slack channel. There's a new events um, <clears throat> Drupal page. So maybe let's see if we're in there. Community slash events, right? Um, yeah, there we are. Hold on, do present again. Very cool. So um, I don't, you don't want to say anything about this, do you, Neil? It's just, it just seems like this is a brand new feature of Drupal.org. Um, uh, yeah, we built that maybe a couple months ago. Uh, it happened before the con uh, DrupalCon Global, so that's probably two months ago. Uh, and yeah, trying to get stuff off of groups.drupal.org. And this has uh, geolocation data in it. So uh, the people on DrupalCal uh, building that site don't have to do geocoding by hand anymore. And uh, we could put our own map up here. We probably will put our own map up here at some point. And there's an API. Yep. 
yeah, everything, uh, yeah, everything goes into the REST WS API since we have that module on Drupal.org. So, yeah. Uh, Dwayne McDaniel just invited me to this meetup, which starts right now in Chicago. <laughs> so if anybody wants to keep on Drupal in, there it yeah, is. Yeah, go, go to every time zone. Flash events. <laughs> uh, Dwayne McWade. So, uh, yeah, so there's ours also. Um, Tampa Bay has a meetup. Let's see, was there any? Drupal Corn is on the third. Oh, that's a meetup. Uh, groups. Drupal Camp Colorado, we mentioned that. Um, great. Thanks so much, Drupal Association. Go sign up, be a Drupal Association member. You get cool tools like this. Hey, John, click on click on our September meetup there. Oh, good idea. <clears throat> Ooh, whoa, we get a banner image and everything? Wow. Yay! That's awesome. That's how you get a kick out of that. <laughs> Oh man, beautiful. Uh, now, Neil, Neil, if we could just clone the nodes for the events, it would make life so much easier. <laughs> there are a lot of fields to fill in. So there's the Drupal.org development issue queue, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, keep signing up, keep sending them money, and you'll keep getting, you'll get that node clone feature soon and the recurring events. Or, but you know. That's awesome. All right, though so that's that's our meetup. Anybody else have any cool things to throw out there? Um, lightning talks. We should, you know, we can do it on the spot. <laughs> Check our website. Uh, very nice photo. Um, so there you go. Volunteer opportunities found. We need help with the website. <laughs> Desperately. But yeah, no, I don't, you know, it, it takes a village to run, to run out of community or something. <laughs> uh, shout out to everybody who came. Thanks a lot. And um, this is, you know, open-ended. So feel free to just use the room and enjoy uh, each other's company and talk about whatever you want. All right. Good night. Excellent. Good night, everybody. Cool. Go ahead and uh, stop the recording so you can say bad things. About it. Yes, that was going to be something I mentioned. I'm I I'm not.